My name is uh, Michael Longford, and I'm the Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Fine Arts. And it's my privilege to introduce Tony Bates this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank Tony, of course, for uh, coming all the way from Vancouver to speak to us today. And I want to thank all of you for uh, taking time out of what I know is a busy time of year to uh, come and hear Tony speak. Uh, Tony Bates has worked for over 20 years at the Open University in, in the UK as a researcher, examining, examining sorry, the educational effectiveness of different technologies in the classroom. Uh, he came to Canada in 1989 to work with the Open Learning Agency in Vancouver and then moved to UBC to be the Director of Distance Education and Technology and was tasked with developing online courses. So he's someone who's researched, taught, and managed online courses in uh, higher education. In 2003, uh, he retired and set up a consulting service. And since that time, he's the author of 11 books in the field of online learning and distance education. This is his latest, Managing Technology in Higher Education, and it's been a great resource for those of us thinking about integrating e-learning at the university here at York. Um, he's also provided consulting services, specializing in training and planning and management for online learning and distance education, working with over 40 organizations in 25 different countries. So just before I invite Tony up to speak, I just have to say thanks to the uh, Academic Innovation Fund, one of the sponsors of the event today, also the Faculty of Fine Arts, and the uh, Institute for Research on Learning Technologies. And finally, I'd like to say a thank you to uh, Marie Noel Hebert, who is a grad student in the design program for the, her work on the poster. <coughs> I want to thank Pam Fernandez, who's helping us to administer our IAF project and helped us with a lot of the uh, organizing for today. And uh, finally, I want to thank uh, Judith Schwartz, who is my co-investigator on the AAF project, and um, uh, is also key in helping us organize this event today. So uh, Tony has been here. Uh, he arrived yesterday, uh, and he's met with a number of different groups uh, around campus. He'll continue meeting uh, with groups this afternoon who've been thinking about integrating e-learning on campus. Please welcome Tony Bates. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be here. I think it's many years since I was last at York University and there's been a huge amount of change, in, so certainly in my area, since, since those days. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, something which is interesting because what I see happening is um, something that's been on the periphery of the institution for many years, that's mainly online distance learning. It's now really getting into the center, and some, some of you may think it's uh, a bacterium, and he's now eating away at the core. <laughs> so I just want to give you a quick overview of what I want to talk about. Why the move to particularly blended and hybrid learning? Why is this happening at this time? I want to go through nine steps to quality online teaching, which applies both to blended, uh, to hybrid, and to fully online learning. Why 2.0 tools are changing the game. I talk a little bit about some advanced course designs and then some conclusions, and I hope we have plenty of chance for discussion. Are you in the right lecture? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Start off with an example from McMaster University, Joseph Kim. He teaches an introductory psychology class to 3,500 students. Uh, my first question is, why? <laughs> but given the fact that's the context in which he's working, this is what he's done. He's t turned his lectures into weekly 30-minute web modules, which is the main content. Not so much lectures, but content up on the web. And that includes short lecture videos of 5 to 10 minutes, extra media like podcasts and so on, and uh, feedback via um, synchronous chat, and, CM and, and computer marked assignments, um, and then weekly tutorials with, with um, TA. So this is a, a classic hybrid model now. So with a half, half the time spending class and half online for the students. So why this move? Well, obviously, large lecture classes. Uh, you probably know the research shows that in a 13-week semester of three lectures a week, you will be lucky to get more than 10% of the students asking a question, and it's usually the same 10%. Um, we're not getting interaction in those big classes in most cases. Um, there's a growing recognition that students can at least learn something online, 
Maybe not all the things that you think have to be done in class, but they can do some things online. And the reason for that, of course, is many of you have added to your classroom a website through Moodle and put stuff up when you find that students go there and use it. Also, really important, new and easy to use technologies, and I'll be saying more about that. And lastly, and I think this is the real reason, the real reason for me why we need to have more hybrid and blended classes is the demands of a knowledge society and particularly teaching, I don't like the term, but it is a convenient way of bringing together a number of things, 21st century skills, the kinds of skills that our students will need when they go out into the workplace. So let me just say a little bit about hybrid learning and I'll come to the definition a little bit more, but the, the traditional mode at the moment is, I think the term is flipped teaching. In other words, you put your lecture onto video and then the students study that before they come to class and then you use the class time for discussion. So, you know, I think most of you are familiar with, with that model. However, it could be so much more than that. Um, and I, I'll talk about that. But the rationales for doing that is to get more interaction and more student activity and to use the classroom time better. Right? Now, we can discuss what better means there. But what it, what it challenges us to do is to think about what is best done online and what's best done face-to-face. -face. And in particular, why should the student get on the bus in the morning, minus two degrees in a snowstorm, and come to the campus when they can do a lot of their studying online now? So what are we adding to that experience of studying on the campus that makes it worth get on the, on the bus in each morning. And I say that as somebody who takes the, took the bus to UBC for many years and watched the students nodding there on a sleeper on the bus. I'm going to go through nine steps. Um, how do you want to teach online? What kind of online course? Work in a team, build on the existing... I'll not read them, we'll go through each one of these. But that's the overview of what we're going to do. And I'm doing this because we have good best practice in online teaching which carries over pretty much to hybrid learning as well. So don't do what the MOOCs have done which is go back to the 1950s pedagogy and just put your lectures online which is what happens in MOOCs. Let's use the best practice so we have good quality hybrid learning. The first question is the most critical one. How do you want to teach? Do you want to go from that large lecture class to perhaps students working in small groups offline or out of the class and then maybe bring small groups together to discuss? For instance, could you break down a class of 100 students into, say, 20 groups of five, give them group work to do online and then meet with each one of the groups over the 13 weeks and have at least one or two hours real good online interaction with them? right? That, that's an alternative. So it's not a question of can I take my classroom and just put it online? It's a question of can I redesign my teaching so that I get the best out of both? And this comes back to 21st century skills. Now a lot of these you already teach. You teach these anyway. But some of them really lend themselves to online learning. Good communication skills. The ability to communicate, not just written, in written format these days, but, for instance, how to do a two-minute YouTube uh, pitch, uh, elevator pitch, if you're doing business studies, for instance. How can you get your idea over in two minutes? Because that's the kind of communication now that, we're, that people are having to use. Independent learning skills. Um, online learning requires students to manage their own learning to a large extent. So it, and we can, it's a teachable skill. We can introduce them gradually to online learning so they become more independent learners. Ethics and responsibility, fine. These incidentally were from the Conference Board of Canada, so they, you may not like them for that reason. Teamwork. This is a classic 21st century business. This is a German design team, actually. They're designing a component for a Volkswagen car. They don't work for Volkswagen, they're a contracted company doing design for Volkswagen. 
They're working in Dusseldorf or Duisburg, I can never remember where it is, and Volkswagen's in the, the, the other side of the country. So they're in constant communication with Vol Volkswagen, they're working as a team, the whole, the whole company's only about six people, so they have to do everything, they have to be multi-skilled. Um, so they have to learn to work in a team, flexibility, ability to um, not, maybe that was the task I was given, but it's not the one that's really going to get the job done, so I have to do something else. Um, thinking skills, obviously we teach those in university, critical thinking, analysis. Next one is really important, and I'm sorry, the people at the back, if you want to see the bottom, you may have to stand up, but it says knowledge navigation, ability to find, analyse, evaluate, and apply information. Virtually every subject domain requires students now to be able to do that. You can't teach the whole curriculum now in four years or eight years even. So students are going to have to go on learning and they're going to need those knowledge navigation skills. Um, and lastly, and really critical, the IT skills embedded within a subject area, the specific IT skills they need in your subject area, there are probably, IT, they're probably computer software that is specific to your subject area. I'll give you a very good, good example, which doesn't seem obvious first. Geographical information systems. Who's using geographical information systems these days? Real estate agents, right? So if you're teaching a business course, you might actually need, the students may actually need to know how to use these tools. Now these tools will come and go, but nevertheless, getting them to know how to evaluate and choose the right tools is a, is a critical skill now, and we need to embed that in our teaching. So that's the first step. Decide how you want to teach, and particularly think of the, about the kind of skills and competencies you want the students to have, what kind of learning outcomes you want them to have, and think about how the technology could help you do that. Now the second step is, what kind of course should I be offering? And there's a continuum. At one end, there's face-to-face -face teaching with no use of technology. I saw that 20% of faculty at York actually don't use any technology, not even PowerPoint slides. But then there's classroom aids, and this is a classroom aid, this is PowerPoint. But I haven't changed the teaching method. If Rip Van Winkle walked in that door there, he'd know exactly what I was doing. I was at a university giving a lecture. So the teaching method hasn't changed, but at least it's better than the... Yes, some of you will be old enough to remember those um, overhead transparencies that you wrote with ink and they get smudged and you have to do them all over again. Right, yes, yes so only three of you old enough to remember that. Okay. <laughs> Hybrid, that's what I've been talking about. We, in classroom age, we're just adding the technology on. We're not doing anything different. We might have a website. One of the problems with classroom aids is we're increasing work and not getting any extra productivity as a result. There is no evidence that using a PowerPoint slide will actually increase learning, right? Um, it's, there's no evidence. They've tried researching it and with and without and no difference, no significant difference. So classroom aids is just adding more work to you and to the students as well. Hybrid, though, is different. You reduce but don't em eliminate your face-to-face -face time. And there are lots of different models. The most common one is the flipped class that I've talked about. But Royal Roads is a hybrid institution. For students do two semesters online and they come on summer school for one whole semester. So that's another hybrid model, but it's a very different one. And lastly, there's um, fully online, or which is a, f is a form of distance education. Now, and so at one end we have uh, no e-learning, and at the other end we have entirely e-learning, but it's a continuum, it's not either or now. And this area of hybrid learning is the one that I think is the future of campus-based universities. That is your future, because your students will need to know how to use computers, whatever they do, and we have the technology and tools now to enable us to teach in that way. So you've got blended learning, and I'm never sure what blended learning is. Is it, that's why I like the term hybrid, because it's clear that it's a reduced face-to-face -face time, and then there's also the term distributed learning. Now, for every instructor in this room, oh, I, let me ask that question. How many of you are faculty? Great. How many of you are teaching assistants? And for these people, don't put your hand up, just blink. How many are administrators? 
Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what kind of course? Everybody has to ask this question now, where on the continuum should my course or program be? Right, you have the choice now. That's great, you've got a choice. But how are you going to make that decision? I'm saying there's three deciding factors. What kind of students you're trying to teach, wanting to teach. It may not be the students you've got now, but the students that you're not able to get that you could get with online learning, for instance. So that might be international students who can't come to campus. Or it could be students outside the Greater Toronto area because your course is the only one that's actually being taught in the whole of Canada, for instance. Or it might mean you've got... Anyway, I'll go on to a bit more. Um, demands of the subject discipline. And that's the re content requirements and the skills requirements. And lastly, the resources that you have available. So what kind of course? For who are the students? That's the, really the critical question. Who benefits from fully online learning, for instance? Well, lifelong learners, people who've already graduated or are out in the workforce and they need, for various reasons, to either upgrade or get more qualifications. They've got, they're working, they've got families, they really don't want to come back to the campus if they can avoid it. So if you can offer them a fully online program, they will take it. So the, these are mature adult students, often well-educated, who are excellent fully distance online students. Full-time students wanting flexibility. 85% of all UBC's distance courses are taken by fourth-year undergraduate students. Why? Quite simply, they can't get into all their classes to get their degree finished in the four years, but they can take an extra course by our online learning, then they can get finished in four years. So they're taking one or two courses online to get the degree completed. And increasingly, uh, and they're taking fully online courses, but with hybrid, we will see more students who's, who won't need to take that fully online. They will be able to, to do it as a hybrid course. Students needing 21st century skills, and then independent learners, students who can study independently and don't necessarily want to come on campus. Uh, for hybrid, I think that appeals more to your full-time students, the very few who've got part-time jobs to pay their tuition fees. Right? No, it's not very few. It's probably 80% of your students now who are working, even if they're classified as full-time. And that, that causes them lots of problems. They miss lectures, etc., etc. Hybrid learning would give them a lot of the benefits that they, they, they can't get at the moment. Subject requirements. It depends on the subject, what you can teach online. Engineering is much more difficult than philosophy, for instance. Okay? So what do students... And I like to divide this into two in answering the question. What do students need to know, which I call content the what, and I've chosen the subject here I know nothing about, haematology, the study of blood, and the second is skills. What must they be able to do with that knowledge? And the skills in haematology will be to identify the components of blood, the analytes, to, for instance, identify the glucose and insulin levels in blood and interpret those results. Those are doing things, but to do them, they have to know things as well. They have to know the chemistry of the blood, for instance. So, <clears throat> so I, I look at contents and skills, and then I would sit down and try and work out my learning objectives and how they split between face-to-face -face and online. So learn the theory and terminology, well, they can do that online. They don't need to come to class for that. Observe analytes under a microscope. Well, unless I can give them a microscope, or unless they can increasingly now there are remote labs where you can go and operate a microscope from your desktop but that's that's maybe five years down the road for most of you so if they can't do that then I would bring them into class and get them to do that design experimental setup using virtual equipment well I could do that online you can you can find all the um, pieces of a, a chemical experiment the pipettes and the uh, flasks and so on and the students that you could have virtual versions of that and you could ask the students design an experiment to show this and you could ask the students to uh, do that virtually video of interactions under the microscope well often you can see things better when they're recorded as videos than you could with four people crowding around a microscope in a lab so I might want to do that online 
but inserting the glucose into blood or taking it out, I'm not sure what you would do in haematology, that's a, that's a mechanical skill and probably would have to be done with real equipment in a real lab. You see where I'm going with this, you know, sitting down and thinking about what you're trying to teach the stu students and what will best fit under face-to-face -face and online. And it will vary from subject matter to subject matter. And that's why I can't tell you whether your course should be fully online or hybrid and what should be hybrid or not, because you're the experts in this field and you should be able to work that out for yourself, what students can do online, what they can't. The third thing that should determine whether you're going to do one of these courses are the resources available. Most important resource is your time. That's you. How much time do I have to do this? And I'll come back to that one. It should not, in the long run, overall, be more time to do a hybrid or online course than a face-to-face -face course. But to do that, you have to have excellent course design. And I'll come back to that in a moment. How much learning technology support can I get? Do I have any instructional and web designers to help me? That is absolutely critical. You do not want to spend a lot of your time trying to load stuff up into a learning management system or trying to do uh, a diagram on the web when a graphics designer would do it better and 10 times quicker than you will. But you've got to have that support. Experienced colleagues. Learn as much from your colleagues as from anybody. If they've done an online course and they know what's involved, learn from them. Do you have the technology available? Do you have the, the, the tools that you need, such as a learning management system? And is it easy to use and is it well set up? And lastly, open educational resources. Now, again, looking at the instructor's time, there is a ton of stuff out there now. You know, seven years ago, I used to go online and look for open education resources, could never find exactly what I was looking for. Now there's a ton of stuff. So, for instance, if you're teaching statistics and you want to show how a normal curve of distribution is, is built up. You can get, a, there's about a hundred different really good animations. I found one the other day, which is really good. You download it and the animation runs and you can't change that, but around the animation, when you download it, you've got the descriptors and you can change it. So if it's a descriptor for psychology, you can take that out and put it put in for biology. It's, a still, it's still a normal curve of distribution, but you'd, that's all you have to do. You don't have to do anything else, and there you've got your animation of how a normal curve of distribution. There's tons of stuff out there, and that will save you an enormous amount of time in creating material. So you've got these choices. Now, who should decide? Well, the normal way for decide is that each individual instructor decides what they want to do on their own course. Well... I'm going to suggest that's not probably the best thing to do. What I think it should be is a program decision. I think it's best decided at a program level because if you see it as a progression from students coming in as dependent learners, needing lots of face-to-face -face support, the discipline of coming to class every week like they do at school, but you see them eventually coming out as independent learners and able to learn on their own, then you need to look at the program and make sure that it all fits together as you go through. So maybe as a program, it's best to decide what the mix of online and classroom teaching should be rather than every individual doing it. And there's a problem too, because if you start choosing different tools, the students will go from one course to another and they don't, you know, they, you may have teach competencies in one course, um, but then you start teaching them the same competency again in another course because you don't know some, another instructor has done it. So you really need to think more at a program level about this. The other thing is, can you think of the way, could you design a course, just one course, with multiple options? So those who want to do everything face-to-face -face can come on campus and do it. Those who want to do it in the hybrid form could, and those who want to take it fully online could. Now, that's not too much of a stretch because if you're designing, let's say, a 50-50 online and hybrid, you're going to have half the course online anyway. So it wouldn't be, you know, you may be able to take the other bits and put it, put it online. It may not be so good as doing it in, in the classroom, but it may reach students who couldn't come to the classroom anyway. Um, so, again, if you're going to, there, there, there are ways, you know, you should be thinking that way. So I ask, what are the mechanisms in your university for making this decision? This is a governance issue, basically. Who should be allowed to make these decisions? And 
I think faculty have to be involved absolutely 100% in these decisions, but I still think it's best doing, doing the, making these decisions collectively rather than individually. So those are questions for you to think about. How are decisions made in, in your institution about this mode? How do you think they should be made? And how do you decide what should be done online and face to face? Step three, critical for good quality. Work in a team. Instructor, or I would like to have that as instructors. I like to see three or four instructors sitting down and maybe team teaching over three or four courses, but at least one instructor, one faculty member, an instructional designer initially, plus maybe the TAs. One model is the, fact that the, the senior research faculty member as a teaching consultant, just like a doctor as a consultant. In other words, you, you, you design the overall shape of the course working with an instructional designer. You decide the, con the overall curriculum. You decide how students should be assessed. Uh, you decide what kind of activities students will need to do. But the TAs do the nitty gritty. They prepare the material. They supervise the students. And you supervise the TAs and the course content. Now, the great thing about online stuff is it's is permanent, is there, it's visible. So you can go in and see what the TAs are doing, you can see the discussion forums, and you can make sure it's up to the quality that you would like. But that's way, one way to control the workload with a very large class, for instance. You're not delivering all the information yourself, but you're acting as a consultant to the, to the team. So other colleagues, a web designer, um, and maybe some IT support. Now this is when you first start. Once you've done a couple of blend, hybrid or online courses working in this way, you probably won't need the instructional designer because you will learn their way of thinking about it. And I'll explain why you need the instructional designer a little later. Why do you need to work in a team? Well, blended and online teaching is different from classroom teaching. And the design of the course is critical. You also need to manage workload. One of the jobs of the instructional designer is... For instance, how, how much time should students spend studying if it's a hybrid course? If they're coming once a week on campus for a one-hour session and doing the rest online, how do we control the workload? Well, that's the job of the instructional designer. Students, if they're working online, need a discipline of doing things every week. If they don't, they get behind. Things mount up. So you provide activities, but you have to provide them in such a way that they can do it within a three-credit three load, for instance. And similarly, they're looking at your workload, that you're not putting in so many activities that you have to mark and, and so on, that you get swamped with work as well. And also, you try to design the materials so the students aren't always calling you up or sending you emails because they don't understand what they're supposed to do. So again, good design will reduce the workload considerably. Uh, you need to share experience and resources. You won't know how to do graphics design necessarily, but the web designer will. So tell them what you want and let them come back with it and let them do the work. And lastly, you need to develop online learning activities for the students to keep them working. In the end, you, what the, the, the trick is to get the students to do the work and not you. Right? So the more you can get the students working, the better, because they're the ones who need the, the qualifications. Step four, build on existing resources. Um, technology tools like your learning uh, management system or web conferencing tools where you can do synchronous teaching. I don't think that's so, so relevant here as it might be in other places, but certainly the learning management system. Learning management systems are a box. And like all boxes, they have their limits. You can only do things inside the box and other things will have to be outside the box. But it's a useful box. Think of it as a filing cabinet. It's a way of organizing your course. It tells the students what they have to do each week. It gives them their activities and so on. But we'll see as we come later in the talk that we can do lots of things outside the box as well. But you do need some kind of box or structure. It doesn't need to be Moodle. It could be something like um, an open source system like uh, WordPress or so on. But you need a box. The students need some structure around what they have to do. And then look at open education resources. I said there's a lot of stuff out there. 
University of Colorado has a great project called FET. Uh, it's a physics project, and they have masses of uh, physics simulations now um, that can reduce but not eliminate the time that students need to spend in the lab. So they can do a lot of preparation before they come in the lab, and instead of having a three-hour lab, you can often get away with a one-hour lab because the students have done all the preparation before they come in, and they just run the experiment, and then they go out and write up their, um, the experiments online. So there's, 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 that's a great way of saving time in designing the courses. Step five, master the technology. As I said, learning management systems provide a structure. If you're going to use a learning management system like Moodle, take a training course on it. I always hear faculty say, it won't allow me to do this, but it will often. What, what, it, what they mean is, I haven't learnt enough about the management system to be able to do what I want to do with it. Um, when you're doing the training, keep asking the question of the person giving the training, can I do this in the learning management system? Can I put a, how do I drop an open, how can I drop an animation into a learning management system? Can I do that? And, and make sure that you know how to do it when they tell you. Um, design with your learning technology people, of course, template. Uh, this, this is what I mean by a template. You can have sort of anything on the screen, but what you've got here is the topics down here, uh, the activities for the day, uh, a graphic, and then links down the left-hand side. Each course will be different, and you want to have a web designer working with you to make sure that you get the template. Once you've got that, that's a, you know, something you decide at the beginning of the course, and then you can go on using that throughout the course. Don't get into learning management system wars. There's not much difference between the learning management systems. Moodle is as good as any. In fact, it's better because it's open source, and that means you can plug lots of tools into it. And explore new tools, which I'll come to in step nine. Step six, set appropriate learning goals for online learning. Big question for you as an instructor. Do I want the same goals as in my classroom teaching? Or do I want different goals because I can do things differently online that I can't do in class? So for instance, do I want to put more emphasis on skills development, now I'm going to be using these tools, than I do in class, for instance, and less emphasis on content? Um, so as I mentioned, subject-specific internet and IT skills. The other thing you can do with the internet is to bring in the outside world. Um, and I'll Talk a little bit more about that when I get to Web 2.0 tools. But you can, for instance, I regularly appear as a guest um, instructor on an online course for the University of Maryland. Um, so I come in um, for a week as a guest instructor because I, my specialism is costs of online learning. And I'll teach that course, that module, that week, uh, mainly through discussion and a uh, um, a synchronous um, web conferencing and on, uh, asynchronous online discussion with the students on that course just for a week. You can bring in other experts and so on to do that. And most importantly, communicate. If, you, if the goals are somewhat different and if the goals are clear in your mind, communicate those goals to students so they know what they're going to get assessed on at the end. Step seven, design structure and activities. This is where I said about the, how do you divide the time up? As a rough rule of thumb, we reckon that three credits is worth about 100 hours of study online for an average student, or about eight hours a week. So that gives you a structure for the course. What can they do each eight hours each week on your course? Particularly if you're teaching fully online because there's no other structure for them. You can have topics or projects um, and in fact, you don't even have to do things weekly online. You can have, say, a, a four-week project that you give the students the work, the work and they work for four weeks. And all you're doing, if anything, is monitoring what they're doing, um, but let them get on with it, for instance. You have to put in student activities, read, discuss, collect, do, demonstrate. Learning outcomes and assessment, obviously, you have to... St and work with your technology people uh, and with the instructional designers to control your workload as well. <clears throat> Step eight. Now, this is really the most important thing between online learning and face-to-face -face teaching. You have to be present online. There, there's a lot of research to show 
that students who f fail often fail because the instructor isn't there enough on the course. Now, being there, what does that mean? It doesn't mean to say you have to respond to every email or every comment for every discussion, but students need to know that you're around, and especially if you're working as a learning, as a teaching consultant. So occasionally drop in and say, that's a very good comment, but have you thought about this? And you'd only need to do it once a day, maybe, in each discussion forum. Five minutes, ten minutes, have a quick look at it. See, yes, they're getting a little off track here. The TA's not really getting them where I want them to go. I'll just add a comment. That presence is really important. Set clear expectations for the students. They need to know in an online course, because they can't come in to see you in, a class, in, a, in, a, in an office, what they're expected to do. So you need clear learning goals, activities, and deadlines. As I said, make students do the work. Give them some standards for which they could expect you to communicate with them. For instance, I say to students, I, I will get a response to you within 48 hours of a working day. So any time between Monday and Friday, I will get back to you within 48 hours. Uh, weekends, I'm off, right? You're working, I'm off, right? But then I will get back to you on Monday. So, and again, you can set your own standards, but I think students need to know, that's the important thing, what to expect. Monitor the discussion forms, and I mentioned being a learning consultant. And the last step, innovate and evaluate. Um, the first eight steps are about competency and effectiveness. These are best practices. We know that if you do that, and you do that well, the students will succeed in an online course. We know that. But things are happening so fast in this field that we have to go beyond competency and effectiveness. This is an exciting time to be an instructor. There is lots of things happening that can affect the way you teach. Uh, there are new technology developments, new possibilities. I'll give you an example, mobile learning, for instance. Um, students can go out now. They've got, they've got this tool, which is an amazing piece of equipment technology they can do all kinds of things with this they can take photographs they can do videos they can do gps positioning there's all kinds of ways you could use students could use this tool to demonstrate what they're learning and what you've taught them so you, if you're, you're thinking not just of taking a, a boring text-based moodle platform and putting it on their mobile so they can read it. Well, that's useful, they can read it on the bus, but there's lots more things you could be doing with this than just giving them graphic uh, text to read. And I'll talk a little bit more about Web 2.0 tools that are coming, but one of the things that's happening as a result is that we're able to design our teaching now so it's much more focused on the needs of individual learners rather than what we think they need as, as instructors. So I want to talk a little bit about online 2.0. The use of Web 2.0 depends on the needs of the learners, where they are in a particular program, the requirements of accreditation. One of the big problems is that accreditation agencies are very nervous about online learning. And if you get too, too innovative and too far ahead of the game, they may not accredit your course, and particularly your educational philosophy. However, in general, these new tools that are coming, and these are not outside the learning management system, are excellent tools for learner-centered teaching and developing 21st century skills. So the suggestion, step nine, is that you should try things out and evaluate them, and that's really important, to see if students are actually learning the way you want them to, and if they're actually maybe learning in ways you hadn't even considered, which is even better than you expected. <coughs> So let me talk a bit more about Web 2. What do I mean by Web 2.0? Well, mobile learning, blogs like WordPress and so on. This is an example of a UBC graduate course uh, done entirely in WordPress. The reason, because the students contribute at least half the content. Because they're out there working and they're drawing on their work experience and providing cases which are then discussed. So this is the instructor's content down here. And this is the students' posts down here. Um, so so um, WordPress allows the students as well as the instructor to contribute. Wikis, American, Latin American studies is a very exam good example. They use Blackboard, a learning management system, and 
the faculty member uh, teaches Latin American studies and uh, he's pretty critical of some of the governments and the government people in Latin America. And they have these private discussions inside the learning management system with the students. But he also got the students to create a wiki, which means that different people can contribute to a topic. So you, it's like Wikipedia, you can go in and edit it and change the topic. So they made that public. And they started talking about the nationalization of the Spanish oil company in Argentina. And the students put that up and said, have you noticed this is happening? What do you think is going to happen to, to the currency rates and so on? What they found was they were getting professors from Latin America joining the wiki and giving a Latin American perspective to the wiki. So they've opened up the course in a safe way to the world. You still have to have, uh, you still have to log in to the wiki like you do for any comments and so on. So they can control it to a little bit, but otherwise it's fully open. And the students manage it. The students take out the rude comments and the students look up, decide how to respond to what's coming in and so on. What are the features of these new technology? Well, portability and mobility. We're talking about flexible learning. These are ideal tools. Students can learn on the bus and they can learn at home and they can learn while they're walking around the campus. More importantly, these tools give the end user, me and you, control over creating content. We can take photographs, we can choose what we want to do. In this case, we're giving students control. Collaboration and sharing. Obviously, social media are all about collaboration and sharing. Collective intelligence. The intelligence of the group is greater than the individuals within the group. Again, we, we're seeing examples of that. Some of the MOOCs that were developed in Canada, not the ones that are getting all the publicity, are basically uh, communities of practice of people getting together and sharing their experience. Low cost, free, adaptive software, and very important for some areas of study, rich media, video, audio, as graphics, as well as text. And students can create that themselves. So the implications are profound. Learners have powerful tools. They can create their own personal learning environments. They can create their own web pages now. They can set up their stuff to put in their tools that they like, like Twitter and uh, Facebook. You have open access to content and services now. You can't control the curriculum. If you decide to teach Latin American studies, the students can go out and find lots of other stuff on Latin American studies that you haven't got in your curriculum. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? Well, I think it's a good thing. What we need to teach them is how to find, evaluate, and apply that information rather than restrict it to them because it's not in the curriculum. Um, so learners can find, create, add, and adapt content. And it's a power shift from teachers to, to learners. But since it's the learners that have to learn, I think that's good. So what we're seeing now is a move from e-learning 1.0 before web 2.0. And this is, this is one of my courses when I talk. And this is a threaded discussion forum. And this is built in Blackboard, or was WebCT at the time. And it's a typical 1.0 course. It worked very well. We got very good completion rates. It's use of a learning management system. I determine the content. I assess the student. I manage the learning environment. And if I wanted to teach that course now, I could add Web 2.0 tools to it. I could ask students maybe to do some blogs, but they'd be outside the learning management system. And I'd still be the one in charge deciding whether they use blogs or not. If I go to Web 2.0, there is more management of the learning by the learner. There's more peer-to-peer -peer collaboration between learners. They've got access to open content. They demonstrate their learning by creating multimedia materials like e-portfolios, which is a collection of the students' work. That's an e-portfolio. In fact, the College of Teachers at, at, in British Columbia now requires students, before, uh, uh, bachelors of ed, B. Ed students, before they get accredited, to have an e-portfolio of their teaching practice. So they have to say what they did in teaching practice, take photographs of the class and so on, and then just reflect on what they did and what they learned from their teaching practice. And that's a requirement now by, for accreditation by the College of Teachers, which incidentally only eight years ago wouldn't accept any accreditation by distance. 
So that's how fast that accreditation agency has changed. And again, development of 21st century skills. I'll give you one example here. Uh, an American history teacher uh, teaches historiography, the sources of history, um, where people go to find sources like birth marriages and deaths and so on. And, and she taught a traditional high, um, five, four week start of the course where she went through what, what the sources were, how to evaluate their reliability, um, the importance of having a hypothesis or a narrative to direct where you go to find the sources and so on, and the importance of collecting and analysing what you've got and writing it up in a coherent way. Traditional classroom teaching. Then she divided a class of 100, or 120 I think it was, into groups of five and told each group to go online and write a history of any city anywhere in the world except the United States and then come back after four weeks and in class present what you've done. So they went off and you had, well, I don't know, 20, 25 groups all together and they came back and they had, last 50 years, of course there's a lot on the internet in the last 50 years, she said it was the best uh, result she'd ever had from students because the students were, for the first time were thinking like historians because they were thinking like a historian does about history. What are the sources? How much can we trust it? What story can I tell from this? And so on, rather than just learning about history, which is entirely different, she said. So that's what I mean by giving students power, um, but within a learning design. So where does that leave the instructor? Well, there are at least three positions. Uh, Stephen Dowds and George Siemens, two Canadians who are behind... Uh, development of MOOCs say there's no role for the instructor. The learners are autonomous and self-directed. They obviously don't have the kind of students that I've been teaching, but, <coughs> but there are people out there like that, and I think that's great for MOOCs, massive online and open courses and so on. The second one is more a big, bigger shift. Guide on the side, facilitate, guide, interact, organise, but give the learner more control over what they want to know about and how they, they go about it but you set some kind of general standards of quality and so on that they have to achieve. And the last one is the more traditional one where the teacher controls and you use these Web 2.0 tools extra for developing competencies. Now, these aren't either or. In any course, there may be times when you're all three. You play each of those roles differently. You may say to a student, you've got to learn this. If you don't learn this, you can't go any further. But once you've learned it, here are some of the things you can do with this and you go off and find things. So you see that history teacher, she said, look, there's three, th these things you've got to learn and I'm going to teach you those. Now go and apply those and then we'll come back and evaluate them as a group. So <clears throat> I'm not going to skip this one because I'm running short on time, but I want to talk about advanced course designs. Core skill is knowledge management. That's what I want to teach my students in this course. How to manage knowledge in this domain. Uh, where do I find the information? What are the reliable sources? How do I analyse and evaluate them? And how do I apply that in my field? And you, that's a pretty general core skill that would apply to a lot of subject areas. Could I design a course with open content? I'm not going to provide the content but there's an overall learning design. I give the students clear objectives. This is what they have to do. I might send them to examples of what people have done in the past, but it's up to them to find the content and meet the criteria that I set for the students. The students have to demonstrate what they've learned by generating multimedia content, online project work, which could combine video, graphics, one of the things they may have to learn is things like copyright permission and so on. Well, that's a useful skill to learn anyway, when they can use content and when they can't, and they would then produce online project work. And I would assess them by e-portfolios. E-portfolios, I think, I'm, I'm a great fan of e-portfolios, but I think what we're saying is that this technology is going to really change our assessment system. Why are we sitting students down to write a paper or a set of papers in three hours with a pen and paper when in fact they can demonstrate their learning continuously throughout the course using media themselves? And wouldn't that be a better way to assess them in a more realistic, authentic way of assessing students than some kind of artificial exam which they'll never have to do again in the rest of their lives? 
<clears throat> Another advanced course design. This is um, from a graduate course at UBC. Um, it's called Venture in e Ventures in e-learning. What they have to do is to set up an e-learning business. And basically, they use WordPress, and the students have to go out and look at new, new, new apps or new, new software, and what their potential is for learning. Um, they do that by the web in groups. They learn, learn about creating a startup business, and then they have to develop a, business, a plan for this business built around one of those technologies, and then they develop a video elevator pitch um, to an investor, and then it's all critiqued by the class. So that, and then when they've had their YouTube pitch, it goes, uh, when they do their video elevator pitch and it's been approved and amended after the feedback, it then goes up on YouTube and is public. So very interesting use of the technology. Taught by two adjunct faculty, one of whom is an entrepreneur and the other one's an educator. Um, but that's an example of an advanced course design. And this one is my favorite from Loyalist College, Border Simulations for our favorite people, Canadian, um, Canadian Border Services Agency, uh, agents. And when they train them, they, they've created a fully operational virtual border post and also in that a virtual car with concealed compartments in which drugs and other stuff can be hid. <laughs> and they split them into two groups, the goodies and the bad, well not the goodies, the agents and the customers. And amongst the customers will be one who's trying to get something through the border guards, virtually. And they do this in Second Life, in real time, in different rooms. And one group has to catch the other, or, and, and not catch the wrong people. They don't want people like you and me being caught by mistake. And they found that the virtual students did 37% higher in the end of course exam than the ones who did it in the traditional way. And that's a really neat way of thinking about using new tools differently. So why not rethink a course to develop skills as well as content, increase learner engagement and activity, increase the interaction with your students and you and between the students, get students to find, analyze and apply information and get them to demonstrate their learning through multimedia and assess them through their demonstration of learning that way. So in conclusion, for many students, there are real benefits from hybrid learning, flexibility, 21st century skills, and so on. We know how to teach effectively online, but we need to follow best practices in doing that. So that's known, and that's safe. What we don't know is how to do hybrid courses. So we want to ensure that students maximize the campus experience in a hybrid course. We want to make students to do the work, and we should be innovating and sharing what we do with each other so we can learn from each other. Thank you.